Welcome to the podcast of Living Faith Fellowship in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Now you will hear Pastor Rich preach the topical sermon buried with him from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. We pray that God will use this sermon to speak to you directly. And now to Pastor Rich. So there was this man named George who attended this church service and during the church service he heard the gospel all about Jesus taking the cross and rising on the third day and how he could have the forgiveness of sins. And so George went to the pastor after the service and he said, I need to know how to have eternal life. I need to know how to be forgiven of my sins. And so the pastor led him in the sinner's prayer, a traditional sinner's prayer. But that was a long time ago. And now George doubts that he's even saved because he doesn't feel any different now than he felt before he said the sinner's prayer. George now wonders if his confession was just simply because of a polished preacher's speech and that it was an emotional response. He wonders why he's the only Christian who doesn't feel God or doesn't hear from God or doesn't have those cool stories that every other Christian seems to have. Keep that in the back of your mind as you open your Bibles with me this morning to Romans chapter six. We're going to take a few week break out of Mark. Here's my statement as we begin. Even though our Christian faith can be backed up by history and archaeological and scientific proof, Christianity is not about having head knowledge. Christianity is all about having a real living relationship with the creator God of the universe. At the moment somebody receives Jesus by faith, they receive the Holy Spirit who comes to live with inside of them and also, catch this, provides the supernatural power they need to live for him. So if you have your sermon notes, Roman numeral one, new life begins with death. That seems counterproductive, doesn't it? New life begins with death. If your Bibles are open, Romans chapter six, let's begin with verse one. The apostle Paul said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? So kind of to back up a little bit within chapter five of Romans, Paul has been speaking about the law and grace pretty extensively. And as he explained there in chapter five, grace was not an addition to God's plan, but it was part of God's plan from the moment of creation. But once the law was made known to man, our awareness of sin started to happen within our hearts. As that reality of sin began to kind of churn within our minds and our hearts, we started to realize that our sin actually separates us from our God. The prophet Isaiah put it this way, Isaiah 59, 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Warren Wiersbe said this about Romans 6. But as the law made man's sin increase, grace abounded more and more and more. God's grace was more than adequate to deal with man's sin. And even though sin and death still reign in this world, God's grace is reigning all the more through the righteousness of Christ. You see, up until now in the book of Romans, Paul had been teaching that believers are justified by faith in Christ, not by the law, not by any good works. It's all by faith in Christ. And so as chapter six starts, Paul wants to answer some potentially illogical statements and questions. There's some illogical stuff that people have come up with from Paul's teaching. Number one there in your notes. If God's grace overflows, that's abounds when we sin, then why shouldn't we continue in a sinful lifestyle and allow his grace to overflow all the more? I mean, if we get more grace because we sin, man, let's go sin some more. I need more of God's grace. 
The second statement is, if we're no longer ruled by the law of Moses, then we can live any old way we see fit. Paul addressed the law of Moses in Romans 6, but here's the key, Christian. Here's some practical for you to go home with this morning. No matter what Paul said here, we always interpret scripture with other scripture. Okay, don't ever make a denomination or belief out of one verse. The Apostle Paul also said in Galatians 5, 13, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. So the question in verse two, if we should continue in our sin, Paul says, certainly not. And in the original language, it's a very strong reaction. It's like, are you out of your mind? That's kind of what he's saying. That's the Rich O'Toole version. All right, so the third illogical statement actually comes out of Romans 7, number three there in your notes. Some thought Paul was claiming that it was the law's fault that sin abounds. So Paul was claiming that God's law was actually sin. Illogical statement. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Again, certainly not. On the contrary, I would have not known sin except through the law. For I would have not known covetousness unless the law said you shall not covet. Verse 8. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all sorts of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Now, back up. This is not the holiness doctrine. Paul realizes that while we're in this world, we are still going to sin. Okay? Some Christians get this feeling like I'm not worthy, I'm not a good Christian because I still sin sometimes. In fact, the Apostle John said it this way in 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin, and John was talking to believers, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So if you hear someone said, you know, once I became a Christian, I was completely sinless. Well, maybe positionally you were, but practically I have not met that Christian yet. But that leads up to number two, baptized into his death. Look at verse three of Romans six. A rhetorical question, or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. As I read that this week, I was thinking, you know, there's so much doctrinal truth in those few verses. We could be here for three months teaching on just those few verses out of Romans. But what I want to concentrate on is our new life, our new position in Christ. Okay? Warren Wiersbe said this, the basic truth Paul was teaching is the believer's identification with Christ in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection. There in your notes. Just as we are identified with Adam in sin and condemnation, so now we are identified with Christ in righteousness and justification. Again, what a great passage to study since there's going to be three baptisms second service. But Paul starts with this rhetorical question. Do you not know as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? You died. There in your notes. The word baptizo, baptism, in Greek means to immerse, to submerge, or to overwhelm. This is why we practice immersion when we baptize believers who publicly declare their faith or identify with Jesus Christ. The confusion happens oftentimes because there are three different kinds of baptisms named in the New Testament. We'll go over them just really quickly. There is first John's baptism of repentance, which became obsolete once Jesus took the cross, okay? Then there's the believer's baptism. That's what we witness here all the time. When we open up these doors here and the baptismal tank is there and you see someone who has professed Christ publicly dunked, that's a believer's or a water baptism. 
And then finally, there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Water baptism is only for someone who has previously declared faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they represent it by going into the water. The water in no way saves them. Okay, salvation happened when they professed Christ. When they go into the water, they're just publicly telling y'all, okay? But it represents dying to the old self, going into the water and dying and raising again to new life in Christ. That's what water baptism shows. It's actually a representation of what happened on the inside, which is spirit baptism. So here's the questions then. Who receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit? When does the baptism of the Holy Spirit happen? And what does the Holy Spirit do in the life of the believers? All really good questions. First Corinthians 12, 13, again, the Apostle Paul says, For by one spirit we were all, catch that word, baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we have all been made to drink of one spirit. So number one there in your notes, who receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Again, Paul said, we were all baptized in one spirit. Who's he talking to? So we studied the book of 1 Corinthians a year and a half ago or so, and we talked about this then. When Paul was talking to the Corinthian church, remember who these guys were. They were saved believers who were behaving like the world. And the Apostle Paul tells these carnal Christians, we were all baptized by the Spirit. And you'd go, well, wait a minute. They're not good boys and girls. They're carnal Christians. Who was he speaking to? Carnal and on fire Christians alike. Here's the thing. If water baptism is necessary for salvation, then the Bible contradicts itself. And we know, we know that we know that we know that our salvation is not based on good works. We know that it comes by grace through faith in Christ. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. All right, so question two is, so when does the baptism of the Holy Spirit take place? Let me tell you what gotquestions.org said. The Spirit of God places the believer into union with Christ and into union with other believers in the body at the moment of salvation. Now, there are churches and denominations that talk about a second work of grace or a second baptism of the Holy Spirit after the first initial baptism takes place. And I think they're confusing that second work of grace with surrendering. And let me try and prove it to you this way. Paul issued a command to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be drunk, but be filled. Filled in the original language means controlled by. So again, Wearsby said the verb fill has nothing to do with quantity or contents as though we were empty vessels needing something to fill up an empty pitcher. But there is a twofold admonition in Ephesians 5.18. Number one, don't be drunk with, that's controlled by the old life, wine, don't be controlled by, notice it wasn't a total, you can never have a drink. No, it was, don't be controlled by drink. Don't be controlled by anything in the world. Second admonition, but be controlled by the Holy Spirit. So there's a positional and a practical truth to all of this, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, positionally, at the moment somebody by faith, by trust, receives that free gift of salvation. The moment they're like, yes, Jesus, I believe you. I believe you took the cross. I believe you shed your blood for me. I believe you rose on the third day and I'm receiving your free gift because of everything you did, nothing I did. The moment they truly trust and believe that, boom, they receive the Holy Spirit. Not half of it, all of it. So that's positionally, practically, 
I have to, and I used to say day by day, but this is a lie. I have to moment by moment surrender to the control of the Holy Spirit. Because let me tell you, I do really good. Got up at 1220 this morning and at 1221, I was doing great. 1222, oops. And so I had to, at that moment, surrender again. And when you know it about 1224, I had to do it again and 1226 and so on and so forth. It's a moment by moment surrender. And as we're walking through this life, we have to choose to surrender. Positionally, God didn't, you know, disown me at 1223, but he is asking me to give up, you know, Jesus take the wheel, right? Give him the steering wheel. So spiritually, we're told to put off the old man and put on the new man in Christ. It's like an outfit change. You know, here I am. I've got these dirty clothes on. And Jesus said, put on Christ. The new person in Christ is admonished over and over, moment by moment, continually be filled, be controlled by. In fact, the tense of the verb used in Ephesians 5.18 is a moment by moment continual thing that actually happened once. But what it is, is it happened at salvation, but practically moment by moment, be controlled by the Holy Spirit. All right. So number three, and here's the question then, what does the baptism of the Holy Spirit do for a believer? We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that the baptism makes us a member of the family of God and then gives us newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So at that moment of faith, of trust, not only does he make me a member of the family of God, but here's the part that I'm responsible for. He gives me all the power, all the supernatural power I need now to live for him and surrender to him. The new person is to be filled or controlled by. Romans 6, 4. Since we have been identified in the death, burial and resurrection of Christ, we should walk in the newness of life. Imagine this. If a true death happened at salvation, I mean, this would really be weird, right? If we all at the moment of salvation physically died and then physically Jesus brought us all back to life, we'd all have cool testimonies, right? There never, I don't think there'd ever be a question again. He killed me. He brought me back to life. I know that I know that I know. Well, this is what David Guzik said. Something dramatic and life changing happened in the life of a believer. You can't die and rise again without it changing your life. The believer has a real, although spiritual, death and resurrection with Christ. And then notice again, verse five, so we've been united together with him. And Leon Morris said, this is a close union. It means to be grafted in like a branch to a tree. That's what happened at salvation. You were grafted in. All right. So Roman numeral three, if you're in Christ, you died. You died. Look at verse six. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There in your notes, first of all, the words done away with in Romans 6, 6 means to render idle, unemployed, inactive or inoperable. Paul is saying a change in relationship between you and God and a change in relationship between you and sin has just happened. 
The law has been done away with. Though it still exists, it has no authority in your life. None. And once we're saved, we're free from the guilt of the law and the shame of sin because we're a new creation in Christ. So tough about Romans 6 is what it's telling us is sin used to be our master. We used to have to obey it. But the challenge is, and this is the challenge I really don't like as a Christian, I'm no longer a slave to sin. So if I sin, I used to have to. But now it's a choice. And see, I don't like to be told that my sin's a choice. I like to say that, you know, I couldn't help it. Right. Don't we like to say that we, we like to be like Adam and Eve and put blame on somebody else. If you're in Christ. You're no longer a slave to sin. Now, when you sin, it's a choice. And again, we all still sin. You meet a Christian that says, you know, once I came to Christ, I never sin again. John very clearly says the truth's not in that person. So don't listen to him. But if we are saved, we have received the power not to sin. So when we do sin, it's because we are controlling our lives rather than letting him control our lives. You know, here's a foundational truth of historic Christianity. A person has to die to live. Maybe you remember the story of Nick at night, the first Nick at night, right? Nickelodeon stole that from John chapter three. But John three, one says it this way. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs you do unless God is in him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus scratched his head and said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and other spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The only way you get to get into heaven and into the family of God is by dying and being born again. I remember roughly 40 years ago, my mom went from a complete drug addict lifestyle and she received Christ and she was a Jesus freak in every way you can imagine. And she went to this dinner, I think it was at the American Legion. And she got to talking to the lady across from her and the lady across from her said, oh, you're one of those born again Christians. I'm just a Christian. I was a young Christian at that time, but boy, I wish I was at that dinner. I'm glad I wasn't because I probably would not have done it in love. But John three very clearly says, unless you're born again, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You have to die and you have to be raised to new life. If you're not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I've been crucified. If you have been crucified with Christ and you were dead and raised to new life. And now you're the new person. The old rich O'Toole was crucified, dead, buried, put in the grave. And the new man, which is Christ in me, the hope of glory comes to live within me. Who is powerful enough to raise up the old rich O'Toole? But Christ alone. Something remarkable happens when you truly, truly come to know Christ. Though people can't see it on the outside, Rich O'Toole was crucified. He was buried and Jesus came to live within me. And so the death of the old you spiritually, you become Christ in you, the hope of glory. And though at first people around me may not have seen that, but I identify with Christ. You see, the old man again was connected with Adam in the fall in the garden. The new man 
is connected to Christ who rose and lives in me. Paul said it this way in Ephesians 2, 1. And you, he made alive who were dead. You were what? You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. God's law can't make us righteous. Good deeds can't make us righteous. Giving to an organization can't make us righteous. Serving an organization can't make us righteous. Only dying and being raised in Christ makes you righteous. There in your notes, Richard Lenski said, in us, there was nothing even to sicken or to weaken our old man, much less to murder him by crucifixion. God had to do all this. And then notice in verse 10, it says, he died once for all. Once. We don't re-crucify Christ every Sunday. We don't re-crucify Christ every time we sin. He died once for the world's sin problem. And, and notice then it says, the life that he now lives he lives for God. Here's the convicting part of the message. The life that he now lives, he lives for God. That means we're given a new life to live for God and not for self. Ouch. We're not freed from the power of sin and death so that we could spend it on carnal living. We were freed so that we can now live for God. This is what Spurgeon said. If God had given to you and to me an entirely new life in Christ, how can that new life spend itself after the fashion of the old life? There in your notes. Shall the spiritual live as the carnal? How can you that were the servants of sin, but have been made free by the precious blood, go back to the old slavery? But there's another truth. And this is such a cool scripture from the Apostle Peter, actually, this time. We hear messages like this, and again, we think we're not worthy. And apart from Christ, you're not. So that's okay. But in Christ, you are all that in a bag of chips. Listen to what Peter said, 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away. It doesn't what? It doesn't fade away, and it's been reserved in heaven for you. Now catch verse 5. This is the hallelujah verse. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. How are you kept? By the power of God. You're kept by the power of God. If it's God who saved us, if it's God who keeps us, what could separate me from his love? And then verse 11, the word reckon. You know, if you're from the South, and I know some of you in here this morning are, you'd probably say reckon meaning suppose or to think as. That's not the meaning here. The meaning reckon here means to place in someone's account, to impute into their account. Let's say you bank at Rogue Credit Union and I go to Rogue with one of your deposit slips. And because I like you so much, I put $10,000 into your account. That's the word reckon used here in verse 11. But what this is telling us is it's the Lord who took our old life and crucified it. And it's the Lord who imputed into your account righteousness and his son. He, he deposited it. He did it. Our part then, Christian, is to surrender. That's our part. It's all about you, Lord, because every time I take over trying to rule my own life, I don't know about you, but I make a mess of things. And so my part, he saved me. He keeps me. My part is to do what he asked me to do. That's my part. So practically this morning, Again, I mentioned this earlier, that once we're saved, we're to change our clothing. That's what we're to do. We're to change our clothing. Colossians 3, 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Verse 9. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Verse 10. Here goes the new outfit. 
and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. The verbs put off and put on are, a, again, a one time and complete thing that happened to you. And yet we have to agree to it and surrender to it moment by moment. Practically, one time at the moment of salvation, God clothed me in righteousness. But as I walk through this filthy world, I have to surrender to that day by day. So Merriam-Webster gives a definition of hypocrite, and you'll see where I'm going with this in a minute. Hypocrite in the Greek was an actor or a stage player. And back then what they would do is one person would play several roles. They would have different masks. And, you know, think of a geisha girl or something like that. They'd put on one mask, play one part. They'd put on another mask, play another part and another and so on and so forth. Okay, so once we are in Christ, picture how this works. When we go back to our old behavior, we are actually putting on a mask of a man who's dead. We are living the life of a dead man. I've been crucified with Christ. That person doesn't live any longer. But that's what you're doing when you go back to the old life. The first Adam should be put off because we're of the new second Adam. We've been given new life in Christ. And so here's some action steps that we can take practically. The new outfit, Colossians 3.12. Therefore, because of all that, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. So the Lord tells us we are set apart, but be set apart. Put these things on. Number one there in your notes, tender mercies. This means having a heart of compassion. Adam Clark said it's something that's tender, sensitive to touch. And the apostle would say, the compassion that we show, the slightest bit of compassion, is tender mercies. Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Tender mercies. Number two, kindness. This is goodwill, understanding, charity, grace, humanity, affection. When we are surrendered to the Holy Spirit, we will have those attributes. We will naturally be kind and tenderhearted. It can't help it. When we're behaving like the old man, when we put those masks back on, that's when we stop these things. That's when we're not tenderhearted. That's when we're hardhearted or we're hurting others. But here's what I found out in my life, and maybe it's different for you, but when I'm hardhearted and acting without kindness or tenderheartedness, when I'm hardhearted, I'm not hurting them, I'm hurting myself. Because God has told me to behave a certain way. And, and when I act as the hypocrite, and then they leave, they may have just forgotten the whole thing. But I'm convicted and my conscience just eats me for breakfast. The third one is humility. By the way, this is the one when you realize you've gained it, you done lost it. Humility. It's so opposite of the world. The world says, be arrogant. But Jesus says, be humble. I want you to think of the time that Jesus washed the disciples' filthy feet. The king of the world, the king of the universe, takes off his outer garment and, and he gets down on his knees and he's washing filthy feet. Selfless service. This is what Wearsby said about humility. It's not thinking poorly of oneself. It's having the proper estimate of oneself and the will of God. The person who's humble of mind thinks of others first, not himself. All right, number four is meekness. Grandfather O'Toole was a big German-Irish guy. He was a longshoreman, big, barrel-chested, big guy. And I remember one time when I was like nine years old, I said something sarcastic and he was trying to be funny. So he picked me up and he's laughing in my face like this. Ha 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 ha. And being the hothead that I am, I pulled back and punched him square in the nose. I was 70 pounds this tall. 
He's a big barrel chested guy. My grandfather grew just purple red in the face, gently set me down on my feet and walked away, shut the bedroom door and gave himself a time out. That is meekness. It's strength under control. I don't know that nine year old me would have been smashed. But I want you to think about a stallion who couldn't be ridden. They're not broke. And the moment that they're able to be saddled and ridden, that's meekness. They still have the strength, but catch this, they're under somebody else's control. That's meekness. Christian, we're told that we have the same power that rose Jesus from the grave living inside of us. But like that stallion, we need to be under somebody else's control. And then finally, number five is long suffering. This is the exact opposite of short tempered, short fused. This is the person with a long fuse. You know, Paul tells us in Ephesians to be angry and sin not. So we can be angry, but sin not. And so this long suffering is someone, yes, righteous anger, yes, things upset us, but we have a very long fuse. We don't just blow up at the smallest thing. And all these characteristics, by the way, you already have. Here's the good news. You have them if you're in Christ. You already have them. You don't have to wait like five years or 20 years or 40 years in Christ. No, you already have them. Moment of salvation, they were given to you. Here's the bad news. You got to surrender to use them. That's the hard part, right? The easy part is for me to sit up here and say, you already have compassion. You already have long suffering. You already have humility. Surrender. We're no longer slaves of sin. We're children of the most high God. We're no longer slaves. So the bad news is, If I'm no longer a slave, then when I sin, it's a choice. And Paul would say, put on the new man in Christ. You already have it. And you do that by surrendering. And especially to overachievers, type A person, I hear anyway, that people who are like that have a hard time surrendering. None of you are control freaks. I praise God for that. I'm a little bit of one. God has to keep reminding me that I'm not in charge. Thank God you're not control freaks. Put on the new man in Christ, surrender. And by the way, when you do, that's when you can just take a deep breath and rest in Christ and not have to worry about what's coming down the road. God's got you, he loves you. You're a new creation in Christ, now surrender. Thank you for listening to Pastor Rich preach the topical sermon, Buried With Him, from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Tune in next week as Pastor Rich preaches a topical sermon on love and marriage. Join us every Sunday morning, either in person at 9 a.m. and 1030 a.m. or online at 1030 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Watch our live stream on our website, YouTube, or Facebook page. Our website is livingfaithclimate.com. To find our Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram profile, simply search for Living Faith Fellowship Klamath. You can also find these links in the description of this week's episode. All sermons are available on our website. Simply click on the Resources tab and then click on Sermons. If you want to show your appreciation, you can tell others about us, subscribe to our podcast, and you can also leave a review so more people can hear the Word of God. Thank you again, and God bless you.